about an M40A1. Uh, the Marine Corps during Vietnam was going away from the concept of you got to take a service rifle and put a scope on it. You know, like an M14, and you got your instant sniper. <laughs> they were starting to look at, yeah, they were starting to look at the concept of specialty rifles, okay, starting from scratch. Not, you know, getting the right equipment rather than limiting yourself to the service rifle and service ammunition. Uh, some of the books that I'm reading, the government for a while there in Iraq bought Winchesters with the long action that could take the 300 Winchester Magnum, but they bought them in 308 with the idea that if they wanted to go to the Winchester Magnum, they could do it by changing the barrel, I guess. And from what I've been reading in the the recent books, the 300 Winchester Magnum is being used more and more for sniping. Like, I think it gives it long range capability. All right, please, gentlemen. Understand? Okay, during World War I, as we know, the Americans were definitely unprepared for dealing with German snipers and their scope Mausers. So a few combat Marines were trained by British and Canadian snipers. And they were armed with O3 Springfields with the A5 commercially purchased Winchester scope to replace uh, five power. And they had to be mounted by specially designed what's called man needing their mounts, named as the two guys who developed it. They actually, the, the Marines actually contracted these two gentlemen to go to the Philadelphia Depot to instruct people on how to mount them on the rifles. I wish I had brought you with tonight. Um, there's only one known photograph of a Marine sniper as identified with the American Expeditionary Force. So there was very few of them. Although there are reports that by the, by the end of the war they had a good standing of themselves. Now when the war ended, as we all know, sniping again fell to the wayside. Although, although marksmanship at the Marine Corps obviously never went away. And they continued to compete with the scoped rifles. But that's about all that remained. Now just before World War II started, they had tested several rifles and 29 different scopes, which we're not going to get into with just 10 minutes. We'll just stick to the, kind of the main ones. Right around the time of Pearl Harbor, Mr. John Nerdle arrived at Quantico with his eight power scope for the to test. And they, they, they tested it initially with mass grade ammo, and they were getting, I think, two and a half inch groupings at 600 yards. I think Andy would even approve a shooting like that. So they immediately adopted it. And they mounted them on 03A1 national match rifles. So all the national match rifles that used for competition to put the neural scopes on them. Now, not all sniper rifles, or not all neural scopes were mounted on national match rifles. Because they ran out of them. They were simply taking any A1, you know, in circulation, putting neural scopes on them. Before I did a lot of research on this, it was always my understanding that these were not good rifles and scope combinations. With no real information to back that, it was just sort of like what you had heard. But the more I read, I realized this rifle can't be beat for its time. They were excellent. Yet, some early reports during the war came back negative. And the theory behind it is, A, that either it was just too, you know, too large for the jungle combat, you know, it was just awkward for troops to use in the jungles. And all through the Solomon Islands and New Britain, the jungle was just so dense and thick that sniping just wasn't going to be real productive. And then again, through the Central, the Central Pacific campaigns, you know, they're just small sand atolls with, you know, brutal, fast-moving battles that were over a couple days. So they weren't getting a lot of positive feedback in Washington. Especially one report that came back from some of the Raider battalions who held a lot of weight back in Washington. And in February of 44, the Commandant actually wrote a letter considering the arm factor and that was immediately start using the Army 03A force. And again, you can't beat the 03A1 National Match Rifle with a Hurl Scope line. Yet they started getting these from the Army. They never officially adopted it. They simply got them through Army Supply. And there are some photos of the Marine British rifle throughout the later campaigns. Now, when they got to the Marianas Islands, Guam, Saipan, later again on Okinawa, 
the larger mountain island, which where the battle slowed down a little bit, there were lots of thousand yard kills being registered. Most of the Royal Scope rifles. But again, there are, there are some of these being issued to them. Uh, right around the end of the war, the Marines tested the M1C. And they approved it for adoption, but the war ended. So officially, they never really adopted it. The war ended, sniping once again went away. Uh, no one's ready for Korea. So the inertial stuttering in, uh, at the Philadelphia Quartermaster Depot are immediately rushed into service. Uh, again, by the second half of Korea, where the war becomes more static, those thousand yard kills come back again. Uh, there's a lot more photographs of Marines in, um, in Korea than there were in World War II. And an interesting thing to me that I, that I pointed out to me was, World War II or Korean War sniper photographs, they didn't wear their helmets. You know? They weren't as safe as you know, you'd think a sniper would be, you know, hidden off in the distance and out of harm's way. They were not. You know, the Korean War photographs, they were wearing their flak jackets. You know, they cover themselves in sandbags, helmets on, and they're, and they're sniper. Um, there are photographs of all three rifles from Korea. The Inertals, the A4s, uh, the M1Cs. One of the most famous battles that I read about, great reading, uh, the Battle of Tower. My buddy Tower was just unbelievable. And on the long pier that goes out to the reef, under the pier at the edge of the reef, where the Colonel shoots up his command. And that was as close as he could get to the island, where he won the Medal of Honor for command in that battle. The first team to land were the snipers. And they held the position under the far end of the, of the pier. And basically, they were counter sniping from that position to protect the command post. That was you know, probably the most famous of their actions during the war. Um, who do you think I'm trying to point a blank now. Uh, oh, they had tested the rifles, like I said before, with, with match grade ammunition, with three and a half inch grouping. But they knew during the war that ammo was not going to be available. So they used regular M2 ball ammo, and he was still getting seven inch groupings at 600 yards in the quantity. So they were more than pleased with the inertial scope rifles. Um, the not, in collector's terms, it, there's what's called a star battle. They want the, the tip of the star, the tip of the battle is the white star. Now, collecting wise, those are the most <coughs> desirable, but it's not true that they were all marked that way. On the bottom ridge of the battle, White star, meant for to show for what we call erosion. You know, the battle comes to become worn out. By erosion. Uh, or erosion. <laughs> right. Then they were not all marked that way. That is also a sort of misconception. They did not all have the star on them. They were not all national match rifles. But they were all the three day ones with John and Earl's school one. That's pretty much it. Right. The star gauge is a, a rod that run down the barrel very slowly and they pump air through it and it comes out the sides of the rod and they can tell by the change in pressure and the variations in the diameter of the barrel. And star gauge barrels had to have very, I've forgotten the, the actual dimensions, but they had to be very consistent. They had to be larger at the breech than at the muzzle, and the paper had to be very uh, smooth. It couldn't be rough or whatever. That's the story. Question: so, Did did both Army and uh, Marines use the barrel scopes? No. no. Only the Marines. Yeah. Those, those, are stamped, those are stamped. Those are stamped USMC. Yes, they are. There were two separate contracts. My fault, I don't remember the numbers of produced in each contract. We two separate contracts. Both yeah. contracts. Saving Private Ryan, it's a bastard gun. Yeah, uh, as Stan would say, it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a curse for us who watch, when we watch war movies. We look for mistakes yep. in uniforms, gear, and equipment. Uh, when Barry Pepper's character is on the beaches at Omaha, he has one of these. 
And I guess for the cost of that, that scene, they weren't going to refilm it. You know, the rest of the war, rest of the war, rest of the movie throughout the war, he has the old 3 day 4 With a marine scope on it. No, no. Now After the Omaha Beach change. scene, he's never filmed again with this rifle. Oh, okay. He's filmed with this one. They were, I guess they weren't going to spend the money to fix the <laughs> mistake by refilming the Omaha Beach scene. Mm -hmm. The rest of the movie, you see him with this. No, this was strictly, again, the Marines were strictly for Army, Army supply, but they never officially adopted it. This was all never officially adopted in the world. The A1 with the Girl Scouts. Oh, yeah. yeah. In the church tower, I think he had it in the can. Yeah, he did. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Thank you. All right. All right. All right. All right. Rifle. Uh, we don't use them all the time, these bolt action rifles anymore. We've really transitioned over to the semi autos. It's a real good rifle though if you're gonna you're gonna be in a hostage situation where you have to take a very precision shot. But you don't want to take one over 200, 300 yards stops because remember, even if you're shooting the middle of angle, it's three inches at 300 yards, you know. It's, it's tough to take an instant incapacitating shot with a, at anything over 300.